Welcome to the podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives, building and protecting your business one podcast at a time, a CASORS family production. In this episode, we're going to talk about the life settlement market, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and the Florida Gators. Our guest today is Jamie Mendelson, EVP of the Asher Group in Orlando, Florida. Asher Group is a life settlement and insurance policy appraisal company. Jamie is involved in joint work with CFP, CPA, insurance agents, estate planning attorneys, trust managers, and banks. She adds value to the firm she works with by providing education and back office support of the life settlement market. Asher is a relationship and family first company. Jamie brings perspective of someone who helps advisors and families monetize existing insurance and annuity assets. Because of our experience with Jamie and Asher Group, we're excited to have her on the podcast as we know her knowledge will help any business owner. Let's get into it. Jamie, welcome to the Entrepreneur Perspectives Podcast. Great to have you. Great to be here. Yeah, so we're going to start with some questions requiring a more thoughtful response and end with a round of rapid fire questions. You ready to get going? I'm ready. All right. So what was it like growing up as a twin? Oh, it was great. Um, had my best friend with me all the time. We... Um, Played together, we you know studied together. Uh, real wonderful. My whole family is great, though. I I grew up with um, two older brothers. Um, we're all great friends today. So our parents did a really good job raising us, and we all hope to be like them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you do a lot with your family today, and we're definitely going to get into that some more. But uh, as we dive in a little bit more about you, you heard the intro about you. I can't do you justice in one opening statement, though. So tell us something real about you that the audience wouldn't know. Um, you know, I, I've been in this market for almost 10 years, uh, in the secondary market for life insurance, and spent a lot of time uh, traveling around the country. I actually studied wildlife ecology and conservation in college with a master's in, in tourism and nature-based travel. So maybe something interesting about me compared to just being in financial services is I love going to Montana in the summers, uh, fly fishing and, and hiking, um, being outdoors, uh, and then I... I like Portland as well, one of my other favorite cities to travel to in Oregon, uh, love Willamette Valley and, and Pino. So That's excellent. Do you get to go options. there? Do you get to do that at least once a year? Um, I try to do that at least once a year. Um, thankfully, with our business, we're, we have a national footprint. So um, mix business with pleasure as much as I can, and, and we have clients in Portland. So I get out there usually at least once a year. In Montana, I'm out in once, one or two times a year. That's awesome. So that you're taking advantage of the travel. We hear so many people talk about travel and complain about the travel that they have to do with their work, but it sounds like you're kind of on the opposite end of it where you see it as this huge opportunity and make fun of, you know, have fun with it. Oh, I love it. I mean, I really try when I'm on the road. I'm a huge fan of diners, drive-ins, and dives. So I yeah. try to go to some restaurants off the, the beaten path or, or not visit chains. So I love to, to eat and experience you know, different cities and their culture. So definitely. Yeah, no, I can understand that. So this is all happening with the Asher Group. So tell us a little bit more about the growth of Asher Group. Um, Sure. Our family started this business in 03. Um, We started as really a boutique life settlement brokerage focused on working and representing advisory teams and policy owners in the life settlement transaction. So we're the seller's rep in the life settlement transaction. Um, After Being a broker in this marketplace for more than a decade, we started um, working quite a bit with sophisticated planning teams, um, you know, state business, retirement income planning teams, um, providing not only um, the appraisals of life insurance policies for sale in the life settlement market, but also appraisal and valuation services. So we work nationally with advisory teams to represent policy owners. Um, We don't do any direct consumer marketing. We're really a B2B organization, and our specialty is complex case design. Uh, We have an in-house team of medical and financial underwriting specialists and contracting specialists. So we're built backwards compared to a lot of alternatives uh, to Asher in this market um, with a a client-focused practice. Okay, so when you were at the beginning, you were saying you started when you started the business in '03, and then eventually you became like a high-end boutique planning group uh, to help ad- advisors out and help business B two B side of the company out. How did that come to be? I mean, was it based on existing relationships you had or your family had, or you know, it didn't just happen overnight? 
You know, it was um, gradual growth, but that really, you know, sped up in this market. I think this marketplace years ago, um, you know, was a marketplace where there was really no regulation. Um, People were doing things that, you know, today, um, thankfully, are not occurring. Um, We feel that we were really regulated into the market. Our firm is one of the largest life settlement brokerages in the country. We work on hundreds of millions, really billions of death benefit in a year. And through word of mouth, as well as, again, these these business-to-business type relationships, we work top-down with a lot of organizations, is how we um, grew our company. Being consistent in this business, being a professional firm, having the team of people that we've had. Um, Many of our team members have been with Asher for a decade or more. Um, and that's really the strength of Asher. It's our ability, again, to work on these complex case designs, to be able to think outside the box, to collaborate with advisory teams. And, you know, through our relationships with, you know, attorneys, CPAs, um, trust departments, insurance specialists, wealth managers all over the country, we've been able to grow our business into the firm it is today, um, solely focused, again, on appraising existing life insurance policies. We don't write life insurance. We don't do wealth management. We don't purchase policies for ourselves. So, you know, that's unique in this market. You know, you find there's there's other firms that dabble in some of those other areas. We really have a laser-like focus in helping advisory teams and policy owners understand the value of their life insurance. And then once they have that information, we will negotiate and facilitate the sale if they're looking to exit the policy or, you know, provide the data they need for their planning discussions. Yeah, I mean, so that that just says to me that you guys know what you do well. You've niched yourself out and then you took a methodical approach. We see it when we've worked with you guys, um, but it's obvious that you don't dabble in every little thing that's out there. You're a master of what you do. And I would imagine you would be giving that advice to business owners, no matter what business they're in, to niche themselves and be good, be really good at at least the one thing that they work on. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our father's a dermatologist, and he always told all, all of us, whatever you do, be a specialist. You know, as a physician, when he went to school, he focused on dermatology compared to, for his purposes, being a generalist or internist. And so he really drove that home for all of us. Um, I have a twin sister, um, like you mentioned earlier, and she's an analyst within um, the healthcare field. Um, And same with her as well as with my brothers, Jason and John, um, that are principals of Asher. We've always worked in specialized areas. Prior to Asher, I actually ran a headhunting company focused in healthcare. Um, My brothers were um, in banking or in IT um, before starting the Asher Group. And Asher is a firm, and, and I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but my brothers were, were really um, focused when they chose the name Asher. Asher actually um, was chosen for a variety of reasons. One, because it's an A, and they wanted to be at the top of every list, um, but also because Asher, um, the definition of Asher actually comes from the Old Testament, the Bible, um, one of the 12 tribes, and Asher means creating wealth with family. Do what is right, you will be blessed. So from, from our parents and from our family and, and all of us, um, you know, I should say three of us went to University of Florida for college. Uh, Jason went to Emory. Um, but there's always been a focus in what we're studying and what we're doing to have a goal of, of working together and, and doing the right thing for others. So, you know, and that name really represents how um, my brothers and I approach this market, but really how our team approaches this marketplace and the relationships with the advisory teams and, and policy owners and insurers we work with. Yeah. So, I mean, what I love about it is that there's a story and a legacy behind it. You talk about your father kind of ingraining all this in, in you and your brothers and your sister. And, and then the story behind the different things that you do, whether I knew what Asher meant beforehand or not, I get to learn that story direct from you and how much it means to you. And then people that come and work for your company are going to have this ingrained in them over time. And if they become a part of that culture, they're going to fit and they're going to be there, like you said, for a decade or more. Correct. I mean, if they don't have that goal, if, if everyone, you know, isn't here recognizing that, you know, we're in partnership with the advisors and the, the consumers that we're working with, then they're not a fit for Asher. I mean, we're, you know, all somewhere in our, our 40s at this point in our career, and we all plan on being in this business and working with the teams that we work with for decades to come. So, 
you know, we enjoy what we do. Um, you know, we help people um, in their planning needs. We help people maintain their, their lifestyle and their independence. We help people create the liquidity events that they need maybe to help uh, maintain their businesses or, you know, do something important to them with their family. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, that advisory teams and policy owners are working with Asher. Um, you know, some of them give you goosebumps helping people keep their loved ones in, you know, a nice assisted living or skilled nursing facility. Um, other times, you know, our transactions are, are like very large, you know, M&A type transactions. We're working on, um, you know, $20 million, $50 million policies and creating, you know, $10 million, $20 million type liquidity events for clients that, you know, have, have different goals or aren't viewing life insurance as an asset they want to maintain. So we really run the spectrum with, with the types of, of clients that we work with, their needs and their reasons why they're, they're looking to understand the value of their life insurance asset. Yeah. So then with you at Asher, what is in your day-to-day work, what's your focus? And then ultimately, what's your goal for the business? Oh, you know what? Um, my focus every day is working with advisory teams. I'm working quite a bit on, on the complex transactions um, to ensure we're crafting the strongest case possible, putting together all of the underwriting information, working collaboratively with um, the various uh, advisory team members, again, from attorneys to CPAs to wealth management advisors, the insurance specialists, and translating the life settlement market, the different factors that are involved with the valuations to the team. You know, I work closely with with our team here at Asher. Um, we're based out of Orlando. We also have team members throughout the country based in New York and in L.A., as well as up um, up the, the coast. Um, you know, and we're working together with all of them. But I would say my focus is really more on the, the complex case design, um, as well as you know, providing education information to these groups we partner with around the country. We speak all over the country. We provide webinars. We're on conference calls. You know, today I'm going to actually be on a call um, with one of my advisory teams and a policy owner to discuss this marketplace and this exit strategy. Um, you know, we love interfacing with the client, um, and that's something that we find um, can really benefit the overall discussion as well. Yeah, and so for the business, as the business grows, is it just to be there and to create awareness around the life settlement market and what you can do for them and just in general? Or do you have a specific goal in mind as you guys continue to grow Asher Group? Um, you know, I think it's continuing to, to focus on um, creating awareness for this market, you know, on planes that we're on around the country, it's still amazing how few people understand this market exists. And there's such an opportunity for policy owners to take advantage of this market with their, with their policies. With the aging population, um, I think the fastest growing segment of the population are, are people over the age of 65. Um, you know, 112 billion a death benefit is lapsed or surrendered on insurance over the age of 65 every year. So this marketplace um, could provide the liquidity event, the exit strategy for clients that could really impact their lives and their planning. You know, when we're working with advisory teams, you know, they already have so many um, different services and or products that they provide that they say, you know, why, why should I start talking about the secondary market? And I think some of the examples I provided earlier, the, the magnitude of some of these liquidity events or on smaller policies, the ability um, to really impact the plan or, or their, their lifestyle and independence um, is powerful. You know, one of the advisors we work with made the comment that never should an advisor have a client that is going to lapse or surrender a policy and not explore this option, especially senior clients. So, you know, I see our marketplace only strengthening. It's considered an, you know, alternative asset class. We're seeing, you know, a ton of capital come into this space from private equity, hedge funds, and pension funds that like the longevity marketplace. They have good results with their existing life settlement portfolios, that there's a real opportunity. So, you know, I think the future for this industry is bright. I think there's a real demand and need um, with our aging population to identify other assets or vehicles they have that could create the liquidity event to help them in their, their planning needs. 
Um, and Asher is really built to serve clients and advisory teams all over the country. We have the infrastructure to do that. So, you know, we're continuing to build and educate our team. Um, you know, the, the strength of, of our team is really what um, makes Asher so special. It's not myself or my brothers, um, you know, although we're, we're passionate about um, Asher and the services we provide, you know, the team that we have here is amazing, you know, and, and the advisors that work with us and the, the, the policy owners and insureds um, that speak with them, um, you know, give us that feedback as well. So that's great. Yeah, and it's, it's obvious when someone cares so much, it, it, it can sound cliche that someone cares so much about their business and they want to help out. Of course, they do all that, but it, it comes out very clear when you talk about how much you do care about your business and then the people that you work with. Um, and the fact that you guys had that methodical approach earlier, uh, when the life settlement industry secondary market wasn't regulated and now it is regulated and you guys were at the forefront of that, um, there's, and you started going into the different options that exist of why someone would even consider a life settlement, because it's like, mm -hmm. why would I ever do that? Let's talk a little bit about the reasons why someone would actually consider a life settlement. Um, you know, that's a, a great question. I think it's really any time that the reasons change for why the life insurance was put in place, you know, that can be the catalyst. So, you know, number one, anytime you have a client that raises their hand and says, I don't want it, I don't need it, I can't afford it, you know, especially if they're a senior client, but I think, you know, most of the fiduciaries or advisors we work with that have a heightened duty to their client have started to incorporate this discussion about, you know, life settlements as an exit strategy, having policies appraised, um, into their applications and their discoveries, but, you know, simple things, you know, someone selling their business, they no longer need their key person or split dollar policies. Maybe a family's gifted out the majority of their wealth and they don't feel they need the insurance protection that they had in place before for their, their planning needs. Um, a spouse predeceases another spouse. Maybe there was a policy in place for a special needs trust and the child passes away before the parent. So it's really the opposite reasons for why the insurance was put in place when that protection isn't needed any longer. Um, other times, and you know, maybe some of your clients have experienced it, but with this low interest rate environment, although it's been great for the market, you know, the cost of capital is down, we're seeing more competition in our marketplace and some of the strongest offers I've ever experienced in, in the decade I've been in this business. But that low interest rate environment has really impacted some of the carriers. I mean, I think a dozen, dozen and a half different carriers have increased their cost of insurance over the last 12 months or 18 months. So that increased cost, that inability for some insureds to actually, or policy owners, pardon me, to actually continue to pay premium on their life insurance is the reason we see it. I mean, one of the biggest factors that's influencing um, the advisory teams and the clients that we're working with is longevity. You know, longevity is something that, is wonderful. People are seeing their grandkids and their great grandkids. However, how many people in their 40s or 50s when they did their planning planned on living into their 80s or 90s or even to 100? You know, I think 85,000 people globally are over the age of, of 100. You know, I, that number is only increasing. Um, so, you know, those major areas, you know, the, the change in, in the purpose for which the life insurance was put in place, increased cost of insurance, insurance cost, pardon me, and the impact of longevity on, on people's plans are the main reasons we're really seeing um, an increase in, in the volume of, of demand for our services, both on the valuation side as well as um, appraising for the purpose of then selling in the life settlement market. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, it, regardless of what industry you're in or what you do in life, things change, right? We might not want them to change, but they change and, and things have evolved over time. And the rate of change that we're living in today in 2017, and you're talking about people living longer, is obviously, you know, changing the way people now think about their future and where they're going to be. And there's an obvious market because of that for the life settlement market. So you're obviously in a great spot for that to have a business that can flourish because of it. But at the same point, like what you're saying is you need to create awareness around the entire idea of life settlements. And yeah. what, oh, go ahead, go yeah, ahead. no, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, you, you really um, captured what I was saying really well. And I think it, it, it made me remember a point that, you know, with awareness, we think awareness is great. Like I mentioned, we educate um, advisory teams and, and people that we, we um, 
communicate with all over the country about this market. You know, but it's really important to understand who represents who in this transaction. You know, there's a lot of marketing that's going on out there, which again, I think is great because it's creating awareness for the industry. But for consumers, for advisory teams, it's really important to understand who represents who in this transaction. Um, there's really three main participants. There's the policy owner, there's the broker, which is um, which would be Asher um, in our role in the transaction, and then there's the buyers. So Asher actually wears the fiduciary hat to the policy owner. You know, again, we don't buy policies for our, ourselves. We represent policy owners in the life settlement transaction when we're working with them for the purpose of actually sale in the life settlement market. You know, on, in a boardroom, Asher sits on the same side of the table as the advisory team and the client. On the opposite side of the table are those buyers, those institutional capital sources. So it's really important to ask that question as people are learning about the market is, are you the seller's rep in the transaction or are you the buyer's rep in the transaction? So, you know, you triggered me with that awareness discussion because, you know, we agree and we are doing our part around the country. Um, you know, we've been published in Trust and State and Estate Planning Magazine. Um, We've, you know, been interviewed by, by other publications and, and media to talk about this market uh, because we do think it's a highly regulated marketplace, something consumers should be aware of and policy owners should be aware of as an option that exists. Um, but it's also important to make sure that, you know, if a policy owner does make the decision to exit a policy and wants to approach this marketplace, that they're working with a firm like Asher um, that actually represents them in the transaction. So it makes a lot of sense, and you, you want to know who the players are. And I do also think when we talk about awareness is sometimes with awareness, it leads to negative perceptions. And the life settlement market, as you kind of mentioned before, had some issues as it was unregulated, and you had a lot of different people out there making a bad name for it. And then that story builds in a lot of people's heads. And we get phone calls all the time, and they're interested in, say, a viatical settlement, or they're saying, well, if I sell my policy, someone you know in, in Manhattan is going to look to you know off me at a certain point, and it's crazy to think that that. But those conversations actually happen. So there's these all these misconceptions about the life settlement market. I want you to kind of address those if you can. Sure, you know, and and that's something that you know I find, um, you know, we're doing very frequently, like you mentioned, with the advisory teams and with the policy owners. So the life settlement market today is very different than the viatical market of the 90s or early 2000s. So the life settlement market today really grew out of that viatical market. Um, you know, the term viatical or life settlement are used interchangeably around the country from a regulatory standpoint. Asher holds, I think, about 150 different licenses. So this is a highly regulated market today. Um, the viatical market was a marketplace of private buyers, small policies, um, and by definition means insurers that had life expectancies of 24 months or less. The life settlement market is a highly regulated marketplace. When Asher began in 2003, this was a, a highly regulated marketplace. We are not a rebranded viatical company. We didn't transition from the viatical market to the life settlement market. We came into this marketplace as it is today, you know, with a little bit less regulation back then compared to what's happened over the last decade. But the life settlement market today consists of institutional buyers, the Black Rocks, the Blackstones, the Apollos, the Berkshire Hathaways. These institutions are building large portfolios of life insurance. They're purchasing on all different types of um, policy types. They're buying on um, insureds usually that have up to about a 15-year life expectancy. So that might be a, a healthy 75-year-old. That might be an impaired 70-year-old. But their duration for this asset class on average is about out to 15 years. I have a, a case going to contracts right now where the insured's life expectancy is 18 years. So again, the market today, a life settlement market today is highly regulated, institutional buyers, um, purchasers that have about a 15 year time horizon for this asset class, and buyers that will purchase you know, $100,000 face amounts, 
or will purchase $50 million face amounts. So that's a really important point because a lot of people have this concern about, um, you know, quote unquote, the viatical market um, that existed years ago. You know, there's definitely still institutional buyers that will purchase policies on insureds that have significant health issues, terminal or chronic issues. Um, however, you know, those buyers and other buyers will purchase much longer life expectancies. So anyone who's listening to, to this conversation today that works with senior clients, you know, especially those I'd say over the age of 70, to make sure you're checking the box and any time, you know, someone raises their hand and says, I'm going to exit a policy, I'm going to lapse or surrender, check the box and see if it qualifies for the life settlement market that exists today. Um, and even for younger insureds to make sure they know this option exists is a powerful conversation. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that my father's a dermatologist um, and he always said when my brothers were, were interested in this marketplace and were thinking about starting the firm, he said, you know, as a physician, my patients come to me and based off my, my licensing and background, they're coming to me for advice and feedback my expertise. You know, as a physician, my responsibility is to provide all their drug therapy options, all their surgical options, and then make my recommendation on what would be best. Um, you know, and if I don't know all those options because I haven't done the continuing education, I'm not aware of it, that could very well be malpractice. And when my brother talked about this industry, he said, you know, as a senior, I go to my advisory team to advise me. I expect them to give me all my options. You know, you're telling me this is a regulated marketplace. If I go to my advisors and I ask them what my options are and they don't provide this option, you know, that's malpractice for those advisors because, again, it's regulated, it's consumer-centric, and it might not be the best option for me, but they should at least mention it to me and then tell me what they would recommend. So that always has, has stuck with me when I'm working with advisory teams or policy owners around the country is to be given the information. A life settlement is not always the best option, but you know, I in my own life like to know what my options are, and then I'll make my decision. You know, but we see a lot, unfortunately, of people who either don't have the education or knowledge about this market, or people who feel like, based off of constraints with their businesses or their broker dealers or you know, firms that they're a part of, that you know, they don't have the right to discuss this or they're not allowed to. So, um, you know, I, I've gone on for a while on that one, but it's important to me because I, I think most seniors especially, but all of us in general, want to always know what our options are. And this marketplace could be a great option for for policy owners. No, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, just look at like the cell phone market, if you will. And if you sign up with Sprint or Verizon, it was like the two-year, and you had to stay it with two years and you had no options. And that, that that's kind of what I'm getting at is, People just want options. They want the ability to do something different um, once they go down a path. For example, if they bought a life insurance policy, it's not the end all be all, right? Maybe there is more you can do. Now, a concern that we have is uh, in the life settlement market, and people ask this question during the process, and I'm sure you've gotten this question before, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, is when you sell a life insurance policy, you are now, you're gonna get paid for that policy, and now someone will benefit from your death. And that's a concern people might have. How do you overcome that concern? You know, the institutions we're working with, again, are some of the largest global financial firms that exist. You know, these buyers have an allocation in this life settlement space or the longevity space um, that might be 1% or 2% of their overall portfolio, you know, when we're working with clients that have those concerns, you know, the focus is, again, highly regulated market. Um, we're doing a due diligence on the buyers that we're working with. Um, there's many layers, many administrative um, parties that are involved in this industry that are, are maintaining these assets. Um, you know, I describe it a lot like the Dewey Decimal System. For those of you on the call, call that are, are, you know, hopefully 40 or over in, in my age range, you remember that. Um, you know, I don't think the millennials today probably know what that is. But, um, you know, these privacy is taken into consideration. Everything is HIPAA compliant. Um, you know, these are, again, really large institutions. 
Um, these are not individual buyers. Um, our firm is focused on approaching this market and not selling policies to fractionalize buyers. And, and that's, again, why it's really important to work with a vetted resource. Um, you know, our organization partners and is, with, is the preferred resource with, you know, broker dealers, um, BGAs, IMOs, um, you know, carriers, law firms, CPA firms all over the country because of the approach and the type of due diligence that we do with the people that we partner with. But I think the, the ask the question, um, I understand that, you know, related to it. But again, um, you know, these buyers are purchasing hundreds of millions of dollars of death benefit. They're diversifying their portfolio across hundreds of lives. So, you know, I, I think it's something, you know, people feel the need to, to at maybe ask the question to make sure, you know, they're checking the box on all those things I mentioned that are important. Um, and why it's important to also work within the regulated marketplace where you're not having a policy sold to an individual whose whole portfolio is three policies. Right. Asher's approach is institutional. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier is know who's involved, know who the players are. And I think that that makes a big difference. And, and seeing that it's so regulated and tightened up today, I think that is obviously a, uh, a major thing going for Asher Group, going for the life settlement market in general. And I think that's uh, we're on we're on the right track with it, and you guys are doing okay. good work. So yeah, I mean, ninety percent of the population lives in regulated states. So most of your um, again listeners live in a regulated state. Um, so there's there's guidelines and and licensing that's required for all the parties involved. Yeah, and I mean, just from my personal standpoint, I've seen it. I've seen the market when it wasn't regulated. And I remember mm -hmm. talking to someone who was in the life settlement market, and after many conversations, he said to me, listen, Eric, I go home every day and I have to take a shower because I feel so dirty. And he was in the mm -hmm. life settlement market, and you're like, wow, that is, that's tough. And he couldn't handle it very long. But that's changed. And that was some years ago, and obviously things have changed. And you know, it's, Asher Group is, is one of the leaders in that marketplace, so that's, that's the main reason why you're on the call today and why we work with you. Um, I appreciate which, that. Yeah, which, which goes to the po point about you know when we work with you, uh, there's something about it that we like and that we try to create the same thing, the same experience for our clients. Um, and I allude this back in every podcast. We'd like to talk about an article we wrote. We have a content platform called Sportsypreneur. And we talk about, you know, business. And we create analogies between sports and entrepreneurship. And we wrote an article um, called John Wooden on the assist, a legendary UCLA basketball coach. And he always talked about how the assist was the most important part of the play. And one thing that I was getting to that stands out in working with you is you become a part of the team, as does the team that you were alluding to earlier. You help and you assist. A lot of companies that you can work with bring ego to the table, but you guys don't. Is this purposeful? It is. I mean, I think, again, I really see, um, and the Asher team sees this as a partnership with the advisory team and with the policy owner. Um, you know, it's personal. You know, we're professionals. Um, this is our career. This is our field of expertise. And when we're working with people, you know, the same respect that we give them, you know, we want that same respect um, to be provided to us. You know, I'm a big fan of, of the golden rule, um, was raised that way. Um, you know, do unto others as, as you want them um, to do unto you. And I believe that in, in all aspects. So these can be um, very, very large transactions, impactful transactions for the clients that we work with. Um, you know, people have identified a problem when they've come to us, especially when they're looking to exit the policy. You know, we want to be part of the solution with them. So, you know, this marketplace, as you mentioned, in the past was full of um, shenanigans. It was like the Wild West. You know, our firm, from the time we started almost 15 years ago, has been consistent and professional in our approach. Um, and in the relationships that we work on. You know, we're not going to be a, a one-time wonder. I want to build friendships and relationships with the advisory teams that we're working with, that we're going to have decades of relationships together. And I think you do that by treating people well, leaving your ego at the door, and figuring out how, as a team, um, we're going to solve the problem. And that's how we go into every transaction is, you know, what are our strengths? You know, what are the other party strengths? How are we going to utilize those and work together to have the best results for the clients that we're working with? That makes a lot of sense. And, and like I said before, we see it we see it play out when we work with you. Um, and we appreciate that type of uh, the type of business that you do. 
And I, I want to kind of lead that into the next part, which is more into your personal life. But I also know Asher Group is very involved with a lot of different causes. But you have a passion to bring awareness, not only in your market, but in your personal life, and mostly to find a care and uncover a cure for Crohn's disease. I wonder how did this how did this cause of yours come to be? Sure. So my twin sister and I actually have been living with um, Crohn's and colitis since we were in our, our early twenties. Um, so something that, that's close and personal to my sister Jill and I, but also to our family. So when, you know, we started being involved with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, which is a national organization we sit on the board for uh, in the state of Florida, um, Asher and the team that we work with here also wanted to be involved and make an impact. Um, you know, it's a, a difficult disease. They're difficult diseases. There's no answer right now. There's not a straight path that you can take of, of drug therapies or surgical intervention to help people. Um, but we try to be role models and examples of people who, you know, can live and cope with the disease and still have successful careers and families um, and personal lives. So, you know, Asher at every national meeting, and, and we exhibit or speak at, at meetings probably um, 30 plus a year all over the country, um, we'll talk about the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation um, and the impact that it can have on people and families that are either living with the disease or um, living with someone who has the disease or knows someone to be a voice that this disease doesn't need to be silent. Um, it impacts so many people, um, you know, and a lot of times, you know, people are, are shy or embarrassed or, you know, can't communicate about it. Um, openly, because it's just something that you know, having to deal with with the bowel, you know, your bowel and and the side effects and symptoms of, of you know, whether it's diarrhea or vomiting or incontinence, um, all of these things that that people who live with the disease have to deal with. Um, we try to be be a voice, so people don't need to be silent um, anymore. And Asher, um, you know, every one of our emails for our company um, has a link to uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Um, you know, we also do a lot, not just for Crohn's and colitis, but my brother Jason actually was diagnosed and um, lived lived through chemo and radiation and, and surgical interventions for um, stage four uh, squamous cell carcinoma, throat cancer, um, you know, HPV related. So, you know, we speak all over the country trying to be patient advocates on dealing with um, creating awareness. Um, you know, raising funds for research when people want to donate. But for my sister and I and for the team, it's really just being there for someone to talk to. I mean, advisors will come up to us and say their wife suffers or their husband suffers or their child suffers or their friend does and just, you know, want to talk about, um, you know, what the organizations can do, what kind of options exist, and just thank us for for bringing awareness. So no, and thank it, you for letting me break, bring awareness. Absolutely. I mean, we, we love to talk about it, and we've got a few different people that we talk to, and, and it's you, it's clear when they have this cause that they support. I mean, Jamie, you have this positive mindset about everything that you do, whether it's traveling and taking advantage of that, whether it's the work and just being proud of the business that you work in and the industry that you work in, and obviously there's something deeper behind it for you and your entire family. You're, obviously, your father raised you right, and then you see this stuff that you guys are doing for not just yourself, um, but for people you don't know, and then just to become a sounding board for others and to help them out. I mean, that's what you're doing, right? It's You're just trying to help people um, live a better life or have find out what their options might be, whether it's a life settlement or whether that's a cure or getting care for Crohn's or colitis. And I think that's remarkable what you guys are doing and definitely want to, you know, in the show notes, we'll leave links and uh, descriptions to all that you guys are doing. If people were wanting to contribute to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, like what's the best way they should do that? Um, you can go to um, the Crohn's and Colitis website and, and I provided that link to you, Eric, so you can put that um, on online, and that'd be great. I think, you know, just even getting involved with your local community, there's um, take steps in almost every city around the country um, that supports Crohn's and colitis. There's different runs with Team Challenge that supports the organization. You know, our parents um, were thankful, and, um, and my siblings as well, and, and our significant others have really supported us um, with these different diagnoses and the and the diseases and you know we've all gone through hospital stays and um, 
and all different types of, of things because of, of these diagnoses. And we always felt blessed that we had the support system that we have. Um, but what we've seen around the country is other people don't have that, and that's why we try and be the voice. You know, I think it's reminding people, um, you know, you might have to cope with the disease, but especially with chronic conditions, you either make the decision to, you know, live your life and cope with the disease compared to your disease controlling you. So we like to be examples, all of us, you know, Jason included, um, of, of being examples to people of not letting the disease or the diagnosis control them or what they want to accomplish or who they want to be with, you know, what they want to do. You might have to cope. You might need to make choices. But, um, you know, we welcome talking to people. Jason on his blog, the Superman HPV um, blog, um, is his. My sister and I have a website, um, Crohn's and UC and IBD.com, where we provide blogs and we'll answer questions. Um, but I'll, I'll send you all of those links. But, you know, anyone that lives with a chronic disease um, or has a child or a significant other that is, you know, um, ask questions to those around you. Ask for help um, if you need to, because I think, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, the importance of support is huge. So don't try and, and do it alone. Um, reach out to people because I think it's it's powerful. Yeah, and it's good to know that really good people still exist out there. So we <laughs> we love hearing that. And, and like I said before, we have a lot of people that we've talked to. Um, Brady Murray, who's a, a client of ours, friend of ours, uh, runs a foundation called Rods, which is Racing for Orphans with Down Syndrome. Um, right. And we have uh, Evan Cutler, who actually lives in Charlotte, has spent a lot of time living in Iowa as well. His father died of Parkinson's. His grandfather had Parkinson's. He does this uh, challenge called Push Ups for Parkinson's. Um, our family has a foundation for in Roswell, uh, in Buffalo, New York, called uh, for Roswell Park Cancer Institute. So it's just like all the different things that you're talking about. Um, there's a lot of great ways to contribute and be a part of, and we definitely want to help create awareness around what, what you're passionate about. So like I said, we'll have this on the show notes. We'll put it on our website, and we'll absolutely you know push to create more awareness for you around it and all the good that you guys are doing. So, Jamie, I really do appreciate you know this stuff. Uh, the, the, in, the intel that you've given around your market, your passion around what you and your family um, do every single day, and uh, really do thank you for that part of it. This podcast episode of Entrepreneurial Perspectives is brought to you by CASCM. CASCM helps you, the business owner, engage with your audience like never before. CASCM partners with business owners like you to help you create your online presence through content marketing, which includes website development, content creation, content distribution, and social media management. From developing your story to execution, CASCM engages your audience. This is CASCM's passion. This is what CASCM does in its own business, and CASCM is excited to bring these services to you. Want to learn more? Simply visit CASCM.com. That ends the thoughtful, more thoughtful round of questioning. We want to move into a rapid fire round. We'll go a little bit quicker, but take your time if you have to. Sound good? Yes. All right. What book are you reading right now? Uh, David Balducci's The Hit. Okay. What is your favorite social media network for business? LinkedIn. Do you use it daily? I do. I use LinkedIn daily. Um, Asher's also on Twitter and Facebook, but LinkedIn is my preference. I love seeing the people that I'm talking okay. to. Um, yeah. So I always bring up a picture as I'm on the phone with someone around the country. So um, it's like I'm talking to them compared that, to just on the phone. Have you... Re have you um, received business as a result of LinkedIn, of finding someone to talk to, seeing that they might be a good candidate and having a conversation with them? Um, I have. Um, and again, we're advisor focused, not consumer focused, but I have had advisors that have sought us out, um, seen our specialty in, in representing policy owners in the transaction and the valuation side that has led to opportunities. Okay. All right. So the confusion, the confusing part of it, what social media app in business has you the most confused? What social media app? Twitter. Twitter. Related to business, I have a hard time yes. navigating Twitter. Okay. A lot of noise out there, isn't there? There's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter, the, the good thing about Twitter is once you get into those one-on-one -on -one conversations or group conversations, it actually can be very rewarding because you can just have an open-ended conversation. It's like the open cocktail party. You would never walk up to someone mm -hmm. in the middle of a cocktail party when they're talking. Now on Twitter, it's like open-ended and you can do that. But I didn't even know is, you could do that. So apparently yeah, there's a just lot a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of noise because every, most people, 
and this is generally speaking, are standing up at the top of the mountain and they're just screaming and not listening to anything that's coming in the other way. So it's it takes two to tango, as they say. So okay. I think that's the one part of it. All right. So if you were to look at your phone right now, what's the one app that's most important to you? My Delta app. <laughs> your Delta app. What is that? I fly. I fly. No. Oh, your Delta business, Airlines. My Delta yeah. Airplane app. That's the yeah, one I seem to look it. at the most to check my status and make sure oh, I'm, so uh, I'm yeah. going to make it. Was that not how why many, you asked me that question? So how many days, like, how, how do you, how, how often are you on the road? Oh, gosh. Um, probably certain months, at least um, two or three days a week, every okay. week. Other months, um, I don't travel again for business um, right now until I think the um, second week in December. Okay. So, you get a little off time coming yeah. up. Thanksgiving's around the corner. As we're recording this, Thanksgiving's coming up. It'll... This will air after that, but no, it makes sense. Yeah. All right, so what's one thing you would tell an up-and-coming advisor in the insurance business to focus on? Um, I would say really listening to their clients and asking the right questions. Um, you know, the importance of a, a good application or discovery um, questionnaire is something that I've learned is really important. You know, understanding the why um, behind why clients are making decisions. You know, so just don't be a, um, you know, a data entry specialist taking in information, like ask the feedback regarding why are they doing it? What's their plan? Because I don't think people do that enough. You know, they just accept an answer and don't try and derive where it's coming from. And what I've learned in, in this business is, is the why is really important to identify the problem to then get to the solution. You have to dig deep, don't you? It's like kids, and they continue to ask why, 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 and they want to know what is at the core of it all, right? And sometimes, yeah. That's and what I feel you like you do. know, a lot of times they were all moving so quickly. Um, you know, there's so many different ways we're communicating between text or email or phone calls um, or social media uh, areas that you know I think we get lost sometimes in in the discussion. You know, we've got to take the take the time to ask the why. I understand. So I know there's many. We've already talked about some of these people already. But who is one person, if you had to identify one, that helped you get re- get you where you are today? Um, you know, professionally, I'm going to group my brothers together um, because they've been great role models for this business and sounding boards and examples of you know the importance of of education and working hard. But I think you know my sister. You know, as my friend and my, you know, support and patient advocate and a lot of what we've, we've done has been um, one of the biggest impacts on my life. You know, having people who you know you can trust and rely on, um, you know, for people on this call that, that you know, haven't found that person or maybe have that person but haven't said thank you or, or really told them how much you appreciate it. I think, you know, that's who, who makes us who we are and, and, you know, will help us develop in the future as well. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to move on to some important stuff. Are the Florida Gators ever going to get back to the success they've had in the 90s and the early 2000s? I hope so. I was <laughs> at Florida 95 to 01. It was like the heyday. Yeah. We yeah, went to right. games and said, how much are we going to win by? <laughs> I never even thought that we could potentially lose. Um, yeah. You know, still, you know, a firm uh, Gator supporter, but I would love to be there and, you know, win again yeah soon. well it's just, it just shows to show you though change happens i i, I offline and, and other times we've talked i have had friends that were florida fans and it really was like you just said it's like how many points are they going to win by they're going to and they might lose occasionally but the, the consistency is going to be there and i used to tell my friends i was like i hope you're enjoying this because you guys are so good but this can't last forever and as an ohio state fan who's now has urban meyer as their coach it's like you realize like enjoy the time of having this great success because there's no way it can't last forever. And that's sports, that's in business, that's everything. So enjoy the present moment. Um, and, and the, But at the same point, you have to get it back. So hopefully for you guys, the Florida Gators can get back to where they were because they were really successful and something to watch back uh, in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, I think they still have great talent. Um, you know, they've definitely faced some challenges, but, you know, it's great to be a a Florida Gator. There you go. Always. You had to get that in there, didn't I you? Did. I did. <laughs> That's good. All right. So what are some words of encouragement you have for the audience? I want to give you the final word. And after that, follow it up with how people can connect with you, however you like, social, email, phone. Um, sure. So I think, you know, professionally, I would say, you know, strive for your goals. Um, as you reach your goals, uh, make new ones. 
or if you realize your goals aren't um, what they should be, you know, reassess them and make new goals. Um, you know, you can reach um, the Asher team at our, our website, uh, ashargroup.com, two A's in Asher. Um, you can reach me on, on my um, direct information. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, Eric, I'll give you my contact information, so they'll have my direct line or my cell phone or email, but we're on all the social medias, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Um, but for all of you on the call, I would say, you know, get outside your comfort zone. If you haven't thought about this market, think about this market. If you're not discussing it with your clients, you know, start discussing it with your clients and giving them these options. You know, be uncomfortable if you're unfamiliar with this. Ask the questions. Um, let us help provide you information. Um, and really, you know, don't let your clients just lapse or surrender a policy, especially, again, your senior clients, without exploring this option. And we're here to, to help you do that, to partner with you, be that resource. Um, we'll be on phone calls, um, conference calls, you know, send you marketing information or educational information to, to help provide you some of the answers that you need um, to be comfortable in this space. So really appreciate um, Eric being here today uh, and anything I can do, please let me know. Absolutely. And you're right, Jamie, thank you so much for, for what you brought to the table today and giving us so much awareness around so many different things. Um, we can a absolutely vouch for what Jamie and Asher Group are doing. We've seen it before. They're there for you. They help you out. And it makes a big difference in doing your business. And it's funny, my grandmother used to say, you don't grow when you're com comfortable, you grow when you're uncomfortable. And then my parents would say it. And then you just said it. And it's true. Um, it comes down for many generations, right? But it but it does make a difference. And that's something that's a way you can look at the life settlement market. That's a way you can look at business differently. Uh, try new things, explore, have, op have conversations. Don't just assume that you have everything all figured out. And Jamie, you definitely uh, brought awareness around that and many other things today on this podcast. We really appreciate you spending the time with us. Thank you. Jamie, it was absolutely awesome having you on this podcast. From the insight on the life settlement market to her incredible courage and fight around Crohn's disease, Jamie is a great example of how to always have a positive mindset. The perspectives she brings as a businesswoman with clear objectives are now perspectives you as the business owner and entrepreneur can use for yourself. And for that, Jamie, thank you. And for any business owner or individual looking to learn more about life settlements or how you can help with finding a cure for Crohn's disease, I would encourage you to reach out to Jamie. You can call Jamie directly at 321-441-1119. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. You can contact me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or with the same name on Instagram. Or you can find us at KazSource.com with links to us on the different social networks. Thank you for listening to our KazSource podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives building and protecting your business one podcast at a time. Until next time, we're out of here. This podcast exists in large part because of CASCM, the content marketing business inside CASSource Inc. CASCM is excited to bring the content marketing services used at CASSource to you. Learn more by visiting cascm.com. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. It's a big deal to us. We hope you found value in it. And if you did, we would be incredibly grateful if you gave us a review on iTunes. Remember to subscribe to this podcast and feel free to share it with anyone you know. More than anything, thank you again for listening. We appreciate it.